Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Enid Slack, and I'm the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance here at the Monk School of Global Affairs. On behalf of the chair of our board, Alan Broadbent, who's sitting in the front row, and the other board members and staff, I'm pleased to welcome you to Policy Making in the City with Joe Penichetti and Matt Galloway. We are hosting this event today with the School of Public Policy and Governance, and you will meet the interim director of the school, Linda White, uh, when she thanks the speakers at the end of the afternoon. Before I introduce the session for today, I would like to thank the sponsors of the Institute, Avana, Capel, Avana Capital, the Province of Ontario, TD Bank Group, and the City of Toronto. I would also like to thank our team here at IMFG, Selena Zhang and Carolyn Carteropol, as well as Matteo Piri at the School of Public Policy and Governance. These are the people who put the whole thing together for us today. Uh, lastly, if you are tweeting about this event, uh, both SPPG, School of Public Policy, and IMFG's Twitter handles are on the screen. And our event hashtag is IMFG Talks. Uh, today's session is being webcast and will appear on our website in the next couple of weeks. So if you missed something, you can always go back um, and look at it. So let's turn to our uh, two uh, people that I want to introduce for this afternoon. Uh, Joe Penichetti retired from the City of uh, Toronto as the City Manager last year. He is now a Senior Fellow at the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance, the School of Public Policy and Governance, and the Global Cities Institute here at the University of Toronto. As many of you know, Joe has given an annual address on the state of the city's finances here at IMFG uh, for the last number of years, and he's always been very candid in his remarks. We thought that now that he's left the city, he might be even more candid. <laughs> Joe has over 35 years of experience in municipal finance management, and we thought it might be a good time to have him reflect on his experience and talk about how policy making, particularly at the local level, has changed over that time. Who better to ask him the tough questions than Matt Galloway? I'm not sure I really need to introduce Matt. Uh, a number of people came up to him before we started saying how they wake up with him in the morning, they shower with him in the morning. Uh, he's very much a part of their life. So I think you all know uh, that Matt is the host of uh, CBC's Metro Morning. He's also the host of podcast playlists on CBC. Matt has received many awards over the years. I'm not going to mention all of them. I might take, cut into their time too much, but let me mention a few. Uh, he's gotten four, for four consecutive years, he was voted top radio personality in Toronto by Now Magazine. He was named a Toronto Hero of 2011 by the Torontoist and Mensch of the Year, I love that one, for 2011 by The Grid Magazine. In 2014, Toronto Life Magazine named Matt one of Toronto's 50 most influential people. We're honoured to have both of you here today. Please give a warm welcome to Joe Penichetti and Matt Galloway. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Beautiful spring day. Um, what better day like today than to talk about the state of the city? Um, if you go to the doctor, you get a checkup. The doctor kind of assesses you and, and gives you sort of the, uh, the, the state of your health statement. You're doing OK. Need a little bit of work. Cut out the potatoes, up your pork pie content, whatever. Um, if we were to look at a checkup for the city of Toronto, just very, very broadly, how are we doing right now? Good opening question, Matt. Um, I would say we are doing very well. I'll start with international rankings, which I been, had been using for four or five years as I wound down at the city. 20 years ago, the city of Toronto wasn't usually even on a list, if you went back in time. In the last three to five years, we are in the top five usually with any of the international rankings from livability, including tax competitiveness, including business investment, social inclusion, of course, right up there always, and of course, diversity. Bottom line is, I believe that um, in the last 20 years, especially since amalgamation, um, the global impact of the city being larger 
and making changes and I believe moving in the right direction on many fronts that I'm sure we'll touch on uh, has made us uh, a city that is looked at and in many respects, in many areas, we're leaders and they come to us now on, on many, in many sectors of our uh, municipal services uh, for best practices, et cetera. So I would say the state of the health for the city, if I was put it at a, out of a, not a doctor, but a, uh, an accountant, one out of 10, yeah. uh, I'd say we are a strong eight right now. An eight? An eight. What do those rankings really mean? I mean, we in the media work ourselves into a lather about them and look, the economist said we're this and somebody said we're that and where do we rank up against Vancouver or Montreal? What, what, I mean, what do they actually mean? Well, actually, most of them, if you, if you actually look at the detailed reports, and I'm trying to remember, I think it's PWC, Price Waterhouse, has a, and it's a livability indicator, and it literally includes behind that uh, title of liv livability, virtu virtually every service and every aspect of, of livability for, the, for a city. And you know we actually have gone up and down with them. And I actually would bring them in and say, where have we fallen? And they would get into the details. Well, transit congestion is worse. So you've dropped on that front. On the other hand, your social services are still strong, et cetera, et cetera. Your, your strong AA credit rating is still relatively, if not high, relative to other comparable cities. So behind those numbers, there usually is a lot. There are some that are very focused. Um, recently, there's been on one, I forget the exact title, but it was basically serving across the globe where youth are looking to move to. And we were in the top three or four. But there's always real uh, background information that supports that, that information. Do you think that we in the city um, recognize how good things are here. No. I've told this story before. I was at a, a pub once and somebody came up to me and they said, you talk about the city all the time and you love this place. And I said, yes. And the guy says, we're not nearly as good as you say you are. That I've lived in London, I've lived in New York. How dare you say that we're anywhere on the kind of scale that those cities are. And it was kind of like, if you were in Boston or if you were in New York, there would have been a, a fist fight. People would have broken chairs over each other, <laughs> knocking you know, somebody's hometown. Here in Toronto, we kind of, all right, I guess we're not that good after all. Do we, do we value those rankings? Do we understand how good things are here right now? I think you're right. The average person does not recognize that or even think that for most of them. Um, I think it's people like us that are in the business daily and deal with those cities. And especially now, I'm in, the next, in the last two or three years, dealing with the U University of Toronto, all those institutes that uh, we were talking about uh, that Ian had referred to. Um, because I've been dealing with the Global Cities Institute for almost 10 years, because I've been dealing with IMFG for 10 years, I know through research that's done at the university that we are leaders in many respects, but we may be lagging in uh, certain areas. And we pick up on it and we try to learn from it and build on it. That's been happening. I think as usual, typical you know, Toronto Canadian style is we don't go out waving a flag and saying you know, we're number one this month on something. We just try to improve our city. And I think we've done a, I, I'm biased obviously, but I believe we've done a pretty good job in the last 20 years. Not just me, you know, former CEOs and city managers, yeah. Shirley, Mike Garrett, whoever. Um, the whole city uh, understands to, I think we understand how to utilize that, that information for the betterment of, of, of the city as opposed to waving a flag. I want to talk about the future, um, obviously, but I do have one question about the past, and that is that you were city manager during a time of um, great excitement and turmoil. <laughs> um, and you were always very cautious about what you said about what was going on in and around City Hall over the last four or five years. Um, now removed from that, what was it like in the center of the storm? Let me start with the role of the city manager, man. I, sh I should note that from my perspective, it's not, the role of the city manager is not to be out there in terms of, you know, generally commenting on 
the political side of things. So when you start with that foundation and that premise, it is, um, I believe, for that position uh, to be more diplomatic and more of a, uh, uh, a person that deals internally within the city and within City Hall. Notwithstanding that, yes, there was uh, a different world for four years. And especially my first year or two were difficult. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, dealing with uh, a new administration that really had uh, no background, other than the mayor, uh, Rob Ford, there were other people there that we basically had to you know, educate related to how things worked. Um, then individual policies were a challenge. There were often times that there were big shifts. But one thing that I did do at the very beginning of, of that term of council, I brought in staff into City Hall, and there's probably a half dozen here today that were in that meeting. I brought them into the council chamber, and I said, there's been a change, and we have to deal with that change. But I also pointed out that we built a lot of policies. There's a lot of policies that have been approved by council, and they're still approved by council, and they will continue. And if council changes that policy, we adapt. We always have to be flexible to a new administration. And I think we, we did that. Um, I mean, there was literally some staff that you know, had much difficulty with some of the changes. But I, I, I made it clear to them that we are the day-to-day -day public servants that have to deliver what council approves. And of course, I've been saying council. The mayor does not drive. And, and that was where there were issues at times as to uh, what the mayor felt he could or should do uh, versus what um, I felt that it had to be a council approval, et cetera, et cetera. And what sort of tension should there be? I mean, should there be a healthy tension between the two, the two offices? I, I think I would say, you know, healthy tension at best. It should be more of a partnership in trying to move things forward. I worked under, you know, the, the, all the mayors to date um, including Mayor Mel, I was hired under Mayor Mel, and then David Miller, and then Rob Ford and John Tory. Um, all, of course, different, but I think with three of them, it was a little bit of tension, but not much. It was more about how you work with the mayor to move on initiatives that council and the mayor have requested. Can't just be a mayor demand. Uh, I think we all know that. And that tension was there for a few years. And I think I can make the statement that um, they understood after a couple of years that it had to be a council approval before anything was going to be amended. And how did the city emerge? And what state did the city emerge from that time in, do you think? Well, I, I, first of all, I, I really believe that a lot was accomplished during the term, notwithstanding what happened with the mayor and uh, call it the other issues outside of City Hall. Um, we moved on many fronts. Um, one, one front that I'm very proud of is the Toronto Public Service bylaw, which doesn't get a lot of airplay. Um, the provincial people that are in the room know that they have legislation that clearly defines the roles and responsibilities of staff and the political side. We had a myriad of four or five policies, conflict of interest, et cetera, et cetera. What we did is mirror provincial legislation and pull all the policies together that clearly didn't really need that role and responsibility differential. I'll say as well that I believe that we tried to table it under Shirley Hoy in the previous administration Mayor Miller, and there wasn't a lot of interest at the council level. And I'll be honest and say I had a window of op opportunity, and I took it in 2014, brought it forward to council, unanimous approval. Because forget just mayors. Councillors often don't like that delineation because they would like to have some influence yeah. as well within their ward. Um, it was also pushed by the ombudsman, who actually recommended uh, it as well, and so we had the, the weight of the ombudsman behind it, which probably made it 
uh, a unanimous vote, not just the content of what was there. But I'm proud of that because it was needed. Uh, needless to say, with some of the things that were happening in the last administration, uh, there were bumps in the road as to you know, in trying to influence staff at times. Let's talk a little bit about where we are now. Um, there is uh, wild excitement uh, in many corners about what people call an alignment between various levels of government. Do you feel that well, excitement? Is this, a, is this a special time when it comes to cities, not just our city, but cities across the board? I might even go as far, Matt, as saying we've got a window of opportunity here, especially with the federal government, which we may never see for who knows how long. I, I think um, the stars are aligned. Uh, most especially infrastructure, transit, and housing. Um, the new prime minister seems to have gotten and heard from municipalities across Canada and cities across Canada that those are two key areas that we need help. It had started under the previous governments, but not um, you know, with the long-term plan and vision that appears to be with this new federal uh, lead, with the new federal leaders. And at the, at the provincial level, I have to say, the last 10 years has been huge. Who would have thought that we would have had literally billions of dollars committed by the provincial government for transit lines in the greater Toronto Hamilton areas? There's hiccups of where they should be, et cetera, not only in Toronto, but in Brampton and Mississauga. But the fact of the matter is there's tens of millions of dollars committed by the provincial government, and I believe that the federal government saw that happening in Ontario and in other provinces and knew that they had to come to the table unlike, I believe, the, the previous uh, administration there. Uh, enough of the project by project, let's lay out a plan and move forward. I would, I would say that it's critical that the collaboration continue and be real between all three levels of government. The concern that some people have is that it is there, but it will become wildly political. You mentioned transit. We've seen that already here yeah. in Toronto time and time again. We've seen it in Brampton. How do you avoid it becoming a political football? I wish there was a magic formula for that. <laughs> um, I really believe that if I was still there now, I'd be utilizing what the, the current prime minister has stated during the election and after, that Cities have to decide what their priorities are. He said it on many, and I believe even the minister, when he announced the, the funding uh, in the last week, referred to it that way as well. And that's critical. Recognize cities as the place where the service is delivered, and they are the ones that should make the priority decisions. But who is that? Is that staff? Is that politicians? Again, there's this, this tension that exists because every time you're talking transit, yeah. that those decisions come up. There's this territorial war. I want it here, and you're talking about something else, but somebody decides they're going to introduce you know, the pet project in their neighborhood so that they can say they've introduced it. You know, I, will that ever be solved so that there will never be political debates on LRTs versus subways? Probably not. But I really believe in the last year to year and a half, started with our you know, outlying of the official plan process a year before I retired. And we, were, we specifically pointed to transportation planning and that they would be in charge. And the one thing I did that was different from the past was TTC drove a lot of that in the past. I sat down with Andy Byford. We had a very good discussion. He understood that transportation planning and the planning for the whole city has to come from the city. And I, th I believe he said that on a number of occasions now. That was a big change. So we now have, call it, the staff at the TTC and the staff at the city working together on what that long-term plan is and how it should be financed. That's going through the process now. I think there'll be, there'll be blips, but I feel that what's happening right now with the professional opinion coming from planning, Eric Miller, ridership numbers and models took a year to develop at the U of T. That goes forward to council with professional opinions behind it that can't be ignored. And I believe the mayor has made statements already that he's looking to those professional opinions and adjusting smart track if need be, uh, you know, line-wise to, to meet what the professionals come up with. I think we're in a different world that way than five years ago, not to mention the last administration uh, mayor having strong opinions on various things that, that 
that also pushed aside some of that professional opinion. What is, if that money is coming in from outside sources, what is the responsibility of the city itself to generate its own revenue? We could debate that for a long, long time. <laughs> I firmly believe, um, and I don't know if you've got a revenue tool question in the future there, Matt, but I'll tie the two together. I, I really believe that um, to try to oversimplify it, any infrastructure funding, transit, and especially housing that has been left aside for too many years, those two big pieces, the long-term plans and the long-term needs have been identified, not just in Toronto and Ontario, but across Canada. So the, the plans and expenditures are there. They're identified by each city. We need long-term funding that is, you know, short of in legislation or regulation agreed to. It can't be just an action plan for five years and here's the projects and we might cherry pick a few of the projects at the federal level, that type of thing. I think because of the change in the federal government, because of the way the province is now dealing with us one-on-one uh, -on -one as well as a city to the province and our, our project request, I think that's going to change. I, ha I hate to oversimplify what ne is needed, I think, in the next year, is call it a intergovernmental infrastructure funding summit. Make a decision on where you're going so that the cities know what the 10-year plan is. It's virtually there at the province right now. It's not quite there in the federal government. And what, but what still will happen, the summit has to talk about funding as the prime source, but the needs will exceed the funding, no matter how you shake it out. And then you have to prioritize and or make a decision once and for all on, you know what, the needs are so great, yes, we do have to look at some sharing of revenues that have never been utilized at the local level. Why is that, I mean, people know that. Intellectually, they know, know that. that. So why, I mean, it's an obvious question, but answer, why is that so difficult? Because to, to come to that point of, because of the, having that tough conversation and making those tough decisions. Because. The, the normal federal and provincial governments never want to, quote, increase the tax. And in many cases, I would argue that, A, you don't necessarily have to increase the tax. You just have to do what they did with fuel tax. We have the example that was done six years ago. Both federal and provincial governments agreed that they would dedicate the equivalent of two cents uh, of fuel tax to cities across Canada and in Ontario so that we get in Toronto $162 million, say $160 million federal and provincial fuel tax monies dedicated to transit transportation. In the city, we take the majority of that for capital, but some of it's used for operating. At the summit, I think that's the kind of discussion that has to happen. Okay, you already get two cents. The needs are short a billion dollars a year, picking a number. Uh, if we had another two cents of fuel tax funding cities across Canada, that would fill that gap. It's not, it doesn't take a lot to work that through. But at what point does the city have to stop kicking the can down the road when it comes to its own revenue tools and say, listen, there are things that we can do as well? Well, I, that's when you get into the tools themselves. Uh, I think that sales tax, fuel tax, corporate tax, income tax, those taxes where I at times felt they should be provided to cities. I still think they should stay at the federal level, but they be dedicated with certain portions of them to cities. Right. But there are others. You still have the vehicle tax, which I feel strongly, you know, the council changed that. I think they should bring it back. I think the city should be seriously looking at parking levies. Hotel taxes have been lost in, in, in some of the discussions as well. It's not huge dollars, but it's there. There, are, And land transfer tax, I do feel strongly, made sense for the city. And without it, we wouldn't have those rankings we've been talking about because we would not have had the infrastructure that, that it has occurred. So there are, I think, a mix, Matt, when you get into the details of it, that some of them should be actually levied at the city level. 
but some of them, I think, should be a dedication of the collection at the federal and provincial level to cities. If you don't make those decisions, and I mean, council may or may well, next year, what have you, um, what is the, the damage from that? Where, where are we at in terms of, because you know the finances, you yeah. know the state of, of, of uh, the city in terms of what it can and can't do. So what is the, 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 the damage if you don't make that decision? We can't handle the growth that's occurring. The fact of the matter, in the last 20 years, we've managed by scraping by with property tax, and thank God for the land transfer tax, which was the equivalent of about a 10% tax increase. Without that, we would, we would have been literally cutting services. We're, we're getting by every year, uh, barely, and without further monies to handle what I'll call the the growth pieces to expand the Eglinton, to expand it to Scarborough and, and Etobicoke, to expand the transit system, to finally have some state of good repair and grow the affordable housing that's needed in the city. That won't happen without those other revenue tools. I feel strongly, it's, it's just fact, quite frankly. But if it's fact, shouldn't it have been dealt with already? It should have been. I mean, that's where the collaboration comes in and I, I still say, that that window and that opportunity appears to be here. I think in the last federal election, what happened was what I believe most residents, after 10 years of listening, realized. That it ain't gonna happen if there isn't some increase in expenditures at the federal and provincial level. Whoever would have thought a $10 billion deficit for the next two or three years and a commitment of, of literally a, another $60 million for infrastructure would have had people saying, I support that. 10 years ago, I don't think that would have happened. Yeah. I think people have been hearing us kicking this ball around for so long now that they realize they have to bite the bullet. But I think the key, key is always dedicating, being clear about where that money's gonna go. And if the federal government says it's gonna to go to transit and housing, and the residents say that makes sense, I think it's gonna happen. When you take a look at the growth of the city, um, what is most exciting to you about the potential of that growth? I mean, it feels like the city is, is, is in this moment of expansion, of development, uh, of it becoming richer uh, in terms of what's there. What's most exciting to you about that? Well, I think the most exciting, and it's, it's, not, it's not new, it's, it's the waterfront. I think it's something that we're finally starting to see you know, what that waterfront can be. And I strongly supported the you know, adjustments in the, uh, in the Gardner East. Um, if you really want to go, I, I'll, I'll be candid, I would have torn the thing down. But that's my opinion, east, east, on the east side, and really open up the waterfront. But at the end of the day, the compromise, the hybrid is still not bad. And um, I think someone that visits the city today and comes back in even 10 years, but more so in 15 years, 20 years, is going to see a complete difference. I think we've got a, the potential, we've been saying this for years, but the potential to really make a difference where that when a, res, when a, a visitor comes to Toronto, they're going to say, wow similar to what they say in Chicago and other major cities. It's interesting Boston. when you talk about the Gardner, though, because people say that had, if we had a big vision for the city, of course we would have torn that thing down. Yeah. But that we don't, that's not part of our DNA, that's not part of where we're going. That we're not thinking in that big, big picture way. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I think we've been do, getting better at it. I think, you know, one thing I forgot is that I did, was able in my last year as well, approve a strategic plan which had not been approved since amalgamation in 2002. And, in, and if you actually read the strategic plan, it's not you know, a huge a variation from what you might have thought, but it's strong. It's got strategic actions in it that would move and be visionary for the future. And when you read the waterfront pieces and, and transportation pieces and transit, et cetera, it's there um, to make the city. And, and I, you know, I, I'm talking too much about transit and transportation. The social side um, and social housing especially. Um, you know, the problem with, with that becoming a true vision, as usual, is coming back to funding. The download of, of 
social services to municipalities that occurred 20 years ago as we amalgamated. And as you know, they took back, I call it the social services excluding social housing. So that's finally been taking back funding wise. And we still deliver. And I want to emphasize that, that I still do believe that the local level is the best level to deliver the social services. But social housing, to me, is something that has to be fixed and, ha and it has to be visionary. You had a report on Toronto community housing, but it was more about the nuts and bolts of getting it fixed. We need a new vision of, call it the social side that has to come forward. We've had individual pieces coming from all of our great GMs uh, for you know, social services unto itself and social housing and pieces and long-term care. All those social programs, I think the city has to come back with a long-term vision uh, that's a, a, a level up from what we used to do in the past that it's a little too into the minutia. Um, some of it may come out of the long-term uh, official plan that's being updated now, but I think that's one area that needs to be looked at. That's the area that we are high in the rankings internationally. We want to keep that ranking. We want to make sure we're always there. And to your point, it needs a vision to start it off. You said that um, housing is, is like a ticking time bomb for the city. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Oh, it's, it literally is that right now, I think, you know, the Art Eggleton report just finally put it uh, in black and white, even though I've reported it twice to council on it. Um, at the end of the day, um, people will and have been leaving residences in Toronto Community Housing buildings because of the lack of proper infrastructure. We cobbled together 800, 900 million dollars for quote the city one third, that's been getting us through for the last two, three years and maybe for another year. Hence my op, you know, optimism for the federal government making that a key priority. What happens, Not if, that what happens if the time bomb goes okay, off? If the, well, we've only got about two or three years, Matt. Uh, in two or three years, by my recollection, that uh, number of people leaving the units jumps into the thousands. So we're, we're maybe, you know, 50 or 100 or uh, 150 a year right now that have to move out because of the condition, we start jumping into the thousands. And I'm talking units, not, not residents and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and people in, the, in those units. So we've only got two or three years. And, and to my point about you know, a summit and funding, to me, housing is as critical as transit. Do you, see, do you think that people recognize the urgency of that? Transit no. gobbles up a lot of the oxygen for the obvious reasons, yeah. but do people understand the urgency? No, I think, as you, you know, and I'm, I know I, at times I've heard you talking about it too, but the average person doesn't know what social housing is. They don't know what we're providing. And, and as you know, we have, in most of those units now, they're the extreme vulnerable. We're not talking about an average, you know, four, you know, mother, father, two kids that are going to school and the, the father is you know, making $50,000 a year. We're talking about the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable seniors. That's the problem. It's a combination of social issues and that's why it's called social housing. And we've got to do a better job at mapping out the future for it. We've got good plans that have started, but the funding has to come in order to solve that problem. It, it will not go away, it'll get worse, and it, it will mean in two or three or four years, you know, problems like we've never seen before. How do you ensure that, I mean, one of the things that we saw in the last four years is an exacerbation of um, splits that may have existed in the city. The fact that it's, you know, David Holchansky talks about three yeah. cities. Yeah. Um, there might be more than that in terms of the way that the city has, has become a bit broken up and that you have people who live literally, you know, miles and miles away from City Hall, downtown, is like another world universe to them. They don't go down there. They have no contact with uh, what happens at City Hall. But the people who are around there perhaps don't have a lot of contact with them. How do we ensure that that doesn't continue? That people feel like they're, they're part of the same thing? And it's not just a campaign slogan. Well, first of all, even planners will say, the, the importance of transit is probably the number one thing to make sure that people can get around from 
North Etobicoke and North Scarborough into downtown and see the rest of the city and become part of the rest of the city. But I, I would argue even vice versa. How many people in downtown have been to Scarborough yeah. Town Center? How many people downtown have been to North York Civic Center? No, it, it's, it's both. And um, there's a lot of good things happening out in the, the burbs not that don't get the media attention, don't get the press. Um, a, a lot of that is, though, related to the social housing. Um, the whole issue of, of um, making those, call it revitalized, existing um, apartment buildings that are TCHC and other private buildings um, and changing them and making them more of a neighborhood unit as opposed to an island is the other, I would say that's part of this social housing vision that I'm talking about. And um, you know, you've heard of tower renewal, that's what it's about. It's not just about the replacing the HVAC. The retrofit, it's, yeah. The retrofit, it's about fixing the bylaws around those buildings and it's, and it's moving, but it's not moving fast but enough. But if you do that, if you give people the capacity to run their own business in those towers, to, to create sense of community within all of the, the, the units that are there. What happens in terms of their connection, not just with the community that they live in, but with the larger city? I think it's huge. I think it, it show, you know, the, the, I go through the, the empowerment of, of residents, the hiring of people within that community. And it's about growing some of those sites too. You know, even though they're dense, it's, it's adding some targeted, retail community center type operations that will make that community transform itself. It's community hubs if, uh, as an example. And with that, I think you have the, both the social divide, if you will, uh, that's alleviated over time, but the growth and the potential of the people that are there are maximized and Hopefully they move to other pieces. And you know what? The other thing I haven't talked enough about, Matt, is not just Toronto. It's the GTA. Well, that was the other thing. So is, the, yeah. you know, the person in, in Etobicoke, hopefully in 10 years, is going to be able to move, you know, get easily in, into Mississauga and Brampton and, and Vaughan and, and Richmond Hill and Scarborough and to Pickering and Markham, et cetera. Um, we've got the big lines along the lakeshore, but I call them the north and east, and, and the north, northeast and northwest isn't there. And it has to get there, and it has to get better. And it's not just about the lines we, that we've mapped out yet. And that's why I really do support the smart track uh, approach to things. It makes sense. You utilize the lines we have. It's going gonna, it's gonna to loop around and join uh, you know, probably at least an extra two or three municipalities that exist today. And that has to happen. So the, we know that all jobs are not going to be forever growing in downtown. It's going to be in the 905 edges of, of the GTA. And you have to have that mobility. Has Toronto pulled its weight enough in terms of the, the growth, not just of the city, but of the region? Have we been partners the way we could have been? Probably not. But I'll say that, you know, 20 years of amalgamation, we were focused on getting our city uh, amalgamated for 10 to 12 years, and then only in the last five years have we started to mature to the point where I think we're ready now to continue to work, not continue, to enhance working with our colleagues. I mean, as you know, I, you know, seven, five, nine, 19 years in Peel, York, and Durham, and what I actually learned there was that Toronto was the engine. Um, but we all know that the long-term growth is primarily out in 905 country. We have to be one. When I was working on the transit investment tools and what's opinions, I, I gathered all my colleagues together in Toronto and we had great discussions about where we should head and, and working together. Uh, over the you know, th almost 30 years of 905 in Toronto, I pride myself in always working with my colleagues in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. If we were working on something in Toronto that would be contiguous to them, I would pick up the phone and talk to them, convene meetings. Staff-wise, 
we're there. Politically, we have to move it up a notch. I think the mayor is you know, wanting to continue and enhance those discussions within the GTA. But it's easy to, I mean, you know, say that we're the center of the universe and that what happens in, in the 905 is in the 905. It's across a road, but we still look at it as a different community. Um, is it incumbent on, on the city to, to understand that for it to grow, everybody else has to grow? The, the same simple way? answer, you spelled it out clearly, is yes. Yeah. I think our counselors, for many that were here 20 years ago, they quite frankly didn't care about 905. Counselors that have been here in the 20 years, when you start talking to them now, they are thinking GTA and, and beyond. They're and also thinking about you know, uh, working together with other cities across Canada. That wasn't there 20 years ago, it's there now. So I think you've got a council mindset that it, you know, is changing, but it needs a, a push, it needs a leader, it needs the mayor to really work very closely now with the GTHA municipalities and beyond, you know, with all the Canadian cities in pushing all of the initiatives and we're all on the same page. We're all looking at the same objectives, the same issues, and the collaboration has to occur. But the GTA, the also the, the oomph and the power of getting all those mayors together and regional chairs and talking to the province and talking to the federal government is huge. Um, and and uh, I can still remember Hazel gathering everybody together for the ice storm conference in Mississauga, albeit I had to, was there with a deputy mayor and a mayor um, as the mayors. And it was clear all united, all had the same issues, and it, it's no different for an ice storm or for transit issues or transportation issues or social housing. We're there together. We should be getting together as a group more often. We have time for questions uh, for uh, Joe, but I wanted to ask one final one of my own, which is that I mean, you're incredibly optimistic about yes. where we are right now. How do we not screw this up? <laughs> what do we need to do to make sure that we don't bottle this? Well, I feel strongly that if they don't have something that's some form of what I call the funding summit of all three levels of government, if they don't go to that length and they just use the old methods, you're right. It will not change. I hope the leaders get it and realize that it's not about sending emails and passing council resolutions. I hope there will be some impetus from the federal and provincial levels. To put everybody in the to room. To put everybody together in the room. The, the premier has done that. She's gotten the GTA mayors together. The foundation is there. Everything we hear about from the prime minister is there. Uh, of course, he's not going to invite all municipalities to Ottawa, but the province is meeting with the municipalities, but having a real solid discussion about how are we going to fund this funding. Unite, agree on something, and then go to Ottawa and say, here's what we think the solution is. And basically, with the FCM, who has done a great job across Canada as well, I think there's an, there's an opportunity in the next year to, to get that done. On the other hand, everybody always says I'm too optimistic. Uh, but th the bottom line, Matt, is if it's not done now, then I'm back to your question, and will it ever happen? We've got a window that we have to take advantage of. And it's not a big window. And it's not a big window. All right. Any questions for Joe Panicetti? Put your hands up. We'll get a microphone that comes out and around to you there in the third row over. Thank you. Richard Joy from the Hi, uh, ULI Urban Land Institute, Toronto. Uh, good to see you. Um, and uh, my question is to one of your latter points around um, regional cooperation. You were describing a fairly optimistic ability for the the GTHA to get along on key issues and so forth. But I think that in my mind that we're seeing uh, a lot of structural problems to making ourselves work regionally that, that, that have never been addressed. That when, when the city amalgamated in, in uh, 1998, all discussion around structural changes about how we deliver uh, municipal level services across the region stopped because it was a, such a dramatic, traumatic uh, experience. Before amalgamation and Golden, almost to a day, uh, 1996, 
spoke about of about 10 different services that might be considered to be regionalized to some order or degree. Um, to date, we, really all we have maybe is a partial one. Metrolinx may be a partial one. We are fiscally less connected than we were in 1998 when we pooled at least some of our, our, our finances. I know we've got equivalencies that have replaced that, but, but we, are, we are less regional even than we were in 1998, you might argue. Do you not see that at whether it's, I mean, I know regional governance sounds like a big swallow, but is there, are there not other for, formal regional constructs that might improve some of our service deliveries that we should be considering? That's a great question. It's a super question, and actually, Richard, I've got strong opinions on that, and I, I feel that the timing is critical now for that review as well. To your point, we're now 20 years after Ann Golden's report, and a lot of what was in that report, of course, was not all translated into reality. Some was and some wasn't. Um, we need that debate, and that no, I would, it will be a debate, but we need that review done now. We need an update of that report to talk about how do we grow the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Um, I think we all know that Mississauga, the mayor, made some comment, I think, about a week ago, and it appears, if I understand it right, that there will be a report going to their council about seceding, if you will, from yeah. regional government. Of course, I lived that for seven years uh, with Mayor McCallion, who just, and she will admit it, she, you know, she just hated the region. Um, and there would be debates constantly. Um, and it's more so there than it is in the other regions. There's only five regional governments left, I think, in Durham, York, Peel, Halton, in the GTHA, then there's Waterloo and Niagara. But we have to go through that again. And I, quite frankly, feel it's needed almost as much as the, the funding side as well, but not as critical as obviously getting the funding put together with other levels of government. I think it's a time for the province, especially related to transit, to relook at governance of municipalities in the greater Toronto Hamilton area. It's needed now. And I could go on for 10 minutes and, or 20 minutes and mess up all the other questions because I have my personal opinions because I've lived out and worked out there. And I know um, what it's like. And I know what could work and couldn't work. Um, but I think some version of what happened in Toronto has to happen in those other regions. What would that mean? I mean, do you, can you actually imagine something like that? I'll, I'll give an example. So transit, I think, does need some kind of regional coordination over and above beyond what's happening at Metrolinx now. It sh but it should focus on, and I can't remember the exact recommendations from Ann Golden's report, but it's more on the planning and decision making on where those lines will be. And so we don't have the fights like we have between the province and the city. At the end of the day, even though I was at the city and I feel strongly about certain things, you have the input from the municipality, but a decision's got to be made. And it's and made, it's, by, that it's made body. by that regional body. It's happening in global cities. That's the way it works. So that's transit. And I'm picking the, the pieces that are regional government responsibilities out there. Water and sewer, another big one. I think Anne's report said it would be all at that level, but I think she went into almost operations. I would say, again, the planning and everything of where water and sewer should be um, across the whole GTHA, let's you know maximize and minimize cost, maximize the infrastructure, minimize costs, and 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 not you know have something because it's within one municipality and 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 across the border from a, another region. There's a lot of potential there. Um, there will be debates about whether that should be delivered at quote the the local city level. York Durham, if you don't know right now share a plant, a huge plant in Pickering. York relies on water from Toronto and from, from, um, and from Peel. They rely on Pickering for their sewer. So there is an argument that you could go all the way and say it's just a massive water and sewer regional service. That's something that, to be looked at. At least the planning and the decision of where the growth is has to be at that, that level. And of course I should have started with long-term planning of all of the major key services of 
transit, transportation, water and sewer that meets growth has to be at this regional level. And I don't think, I see a lot of nodding heads, everybody agrees with that, they came up 20 years ago and I think it's needed. They went with Metrolinks with one focused area mm -hmm. of, of just transit. I know a lot of people see fault there. I think it's done a, a fair bit in a short span of time. You know, Toronto has benefited a lot from funding and from coordination of, of moving on works, and there's a lot already happening right now. But it has to be refined and expanded. Um, but Richard, you're bang on. The governance has to happen now. I mean, when you're growing like the metropolitan area of, of Toronto is growing, um, you need to have those reviews every 20 years. And I, I think we've got a model. Um, I'm sure Enid could do a, an update of the report, and uh, of Ann Golden's report, and we could have the research done and, and uh, decisions made within a year. Um, <laughs> but I, she may have rolled her. I, I do feel strongly that, you know, from the discussions of getting mayors together, I know that you know, th there are many that would want to see a review. Right. Uh, I, and of course, there's going to be many opinions as well, and it's going to be a minefield, but the, the, prime, the premier and the provincial government has to take the lead on that one to say, this is needed now, and, and possibly the Mississauga request could precipitate that and, and, and push it along. Did I cover what you were? That's okay. good. Yeah. Time for a couple more questions. Anybody else? Microphone's coming. Am I candid enough or am I supposed to? No, this is good. <laughs> Another Richard, Richard Gilbert. Um, Ontario Municipal Board, in, in my neighborhood, there is no institution that is more reviled than the Ontario <laughs> Municipal Board. Um, but there's also the feeling coming up at some meetings that the city shelters behind the OMB, that the city uh, quite likes, I mean, I'm using the city in the very broad term, the city quite likes the idea that the OMB will approve things that, that the city doesn't, um, the council doesn't want to approve uh, and, and thereby get the tax revenue and so on and so on. Um, could you comment on the OMB, whether it's a help or a hindrance to the city or, or neither? Um, and the focus is on planning issues, of course, but I don't know if this is still true. The OMB used to have other significant functions to do with capital financing and so on, and no, maybe, no. Um, maybe it doesn't now, but, no. um, but if you could certainly deal with the planning issues, is the OMB a helper or a hindrance, and, and should it be changed, um, should the system be changed, and if so, to what? Here's an opportunity to be candid. <laughs> <laughs> to be candid as I square, squarely face the former, former, head of planning for the city, Paul Bedford, who's two seats ahead of you. And I don't pretend to be the planning expert, but Paul and I have had chats over the years. Uh, first of all, I'll make a comment that I don't, I don't believe what you said that council is, is supportive of. Council, I think, generally wants change there. The, di the issue becomes what kind of change and how far do you go. Um, but I, I believe our council has taken positions that basically, you know, you could broadly say, it, you know, we don't like it and we need change and we need more authority at the local level. When we didn't talk about the City of Toronto Act, which I should have brought up, I mean, it, it was a big change and it was very positive. But on the, um, on the issue you're talking about, we didn't see what we were hoping for there. We were hoping for change so that the city of three million that is like a province would have more powers to decide local planning within each ward, if you will, but at least within each district. And I still feel strongly that that change has to occur and maybe through the mechanism of the review of a regional government, if you will, or regional coordination, um, that, that role could change. I mean, I, you know, maybe we ask Paul, the three of us, after we're done here. But at the end of the day, there has to be changes. But it is a matter of how far do you go, and with with that change, do you does give, it provide a useful do you service give, at all? Because a lot of people say that it doesn't. A lot well, of people there, would like to see it completely thrown out. The, the province, the problem, the promise will argue, Matt, that there has to be a third party body, because municipalities may not even enforce provincial 
policy direction. And that's, that could be true and that does happen. And you see times where the province actually takes a municipality to court or, or has to utilize legislation to say, no, you're not doing that. Places to grow and, and, and you know, some cities that wanted to continue to sprawl into, yeah. the, into the Greenlands, you know, was a good example. And so you have to be careful. There is some responsibility of the province to say, hold it, you've gone too far. And so it's that balance. Do I think the balance is there? No. I think there's still a lot, especially for a Toronto, call it a city that is built out, that's not going to impinge on any green lands. There should be more powers for that city to say, well, just because you have this rule for so many stories or whatever you think next to a parkland, we disagree and we think this makes sense for the local municipality, for the for the ward, et cetera. A little bit more responsibility, I believe, is still needed for those cities that are mature, that know what they want in the city, and they're really not going to you know, impinge on legislation, especially the Greenland type, type uh, growth. All right. I hope that's... A couple more questions over here, go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry, Drew Fagan, no fixed address. Um, <laughs> so let's go back to infrastructure for just a moment. I, your idea of a summit, I think, actually makes sense right now in terms of the amount of spend and the potential for coordination. And let me just put some context in it for very briefly. You know, federal spend of $130 billion, doubling over the next 10 years. Provincial spend of the same amount, about $135 billion. Municipal spend, City of Toronto, 30, 35 billion dollars. You're now talking close to 4% of GDP. Rough rule of thumb, you should be getting, when we think of the 60s and the 70s, we're at about 5% of GDP. So it's not a golden age, but you're heading towards a gold-plated age. I think the question really is how well we deliver it. I think there's certain things the city does well. It actually does better in terms of transparency of its decision making on the upper levels of government. And in some cases, cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. to ensure that the spend is maximized to best possible effect. And I think in some ways the province can learn from the city in that regard. One thing I think the municipality, City of Toronto and others are challenged on though is delivery. What do you need to do to ensure that challenges, problems like the university line, like Union Station, and those type of things aren't repeated, so people have confidence that their tax dollars at a big infrastructure spend is spent in the best way. Great question, thank you. Great question, Drew. Um, I, uh, number one, your, your, your um, allusion to the fact that our service delivery can be better is no sense or buts, I don't disagree. Um, as I was winding down, um, as you know, um, I was trying to, and, and council has adopted, uh, a little bit more looking at, and I, I know the 3P is always uh, uh, debated, but the bottom line is all our capital works are, are constructed by third parties. Um, there's often times when cities want to do some of the work on their own that I believe they shouldn't be doing. And it's a partnership where we have to work through a partnership with Infrastructure Ontario as an example, Infrastructure Canada, and come up with delivery models that will be cost efficient and always there, but as importantly, will deliver in a time frame much faster than we're doing right now. And we've got some of those models happening. Eglinton, in effect, is that model. I think it's working, and I think that when you have this regional governance model now with transit being coordinated in the greater Toronto-Hamilton area along with the province and the feds, you come up with, I would say, approaches that have to be utilized in order to build out so that we do deliver in seven years and not 15 years. And that's essential, as Drew said, to get... It's essential the public to get to buy into exactly. what's, what, what's going to happen. Exactly. And, and you know, I was part of Spadina Subway. I saw firsthand, you know, how some things worked and some things didn't work. And after seeing many projects, I was part of Union Station. You know, should we have had a different model of delivery there? Um, 
Probably, but it would have been a hybrid of what, what we put together. It was a hugely complex project with federal, provincial. I called it the 7P. It was <laughs> federal, federal, provincial, um, City of Toronto, TTC, VIA, GO, and the private partner. And Nicely you done. have no idea what, what the agreement was like. We've, we, the lawyers and a few staff, I remember, finished that agreement uh, about four in the morning or five in the morning of council day. And Bruce McQuaig and I saw the final edits, you know, at like eight o'clock. Um, but back to your point, Drew. Excellent point that service delivery is as important as funding. If you, you can get all the funding you want, and if the service delivery is not coordinated properly and maximized, and I think that where I was often doubtful for four or five years about, you know, 3P and how it can work, I, after seeing it in action, and it's, and I'll, I'll call it a, a massage 3P, which is what Eglinton is, uh, that the province put together with Infrastructure Ontario. It's not like it's thrown over to the private sector. You do a proper bid process, you get proper contracts, you know. Big mistake in Spadina Subway was individual contracts for each station, which we tried to say to TTC staff, don't do that. I hope I wasn't caught up on that, <laughs> but it didn't go. And, and the TTC made the decisions on that. Uh, Eglinton, it's all one contract for all stations, one contract for tunnels. We learn, and, and that will expedite projects so that you know, it's not your grandkids that are gonna see something that you actually funded and put into a plan. It's hopefully your kids. <laughs> uh, time for a couple more quick que questions, go ahead. Hi, my name is Bas Bednar. Thank you for your lecture. I'm glad you're part of the University of Toronto. I'm going to ask a question for the younger half of the room. We're all at the back. Um, I was struck by your optimism at the beginning of the lecture uh, and impressed by it. It's not something that I, as a young person in the city, necessarily share. Something that Mr. Galloway speaks of a lot on his show when we're, you know, waking up together, uh, comes up the kind of rent versus own debate, uh, millennials in the city, Gen Y. I wonder, with something like recently Mayor Tory going to San Francisco, trying to court some of our talent back home, whose role is it to manage the kind of future of the city for to retain and build young Toronto talent? So if I don't see the future, if I don't see the city, uh, a future for me necessarily, being able to transition into a mid-career professional, having a family, purchasing a home, uh, having roommates is cool, but I don't want to do it forever. I don't know about you guys. Who does that? Who, who are the civic leaders that worry about that? Does it happen at City Council? Does it happen at City Hall? Does it come from externally? Because I'd like us to stay on those lists and not become a top city uh, for losing amazing people to suburbs, surrounding areas. That's other a provinces. great question. Okay. And, and I think um, it's a good, excellent question and it's a good example of the discussion about 3P and beyond because none of this happens with just a federal level of government, provincial, city, um, or just the private sector, or nonprofit associations, or a collection of universities, education, and all of our infrastructure being there. It's literally all the pieces of our city that's served by municipalities at all levels of government, all those pieces of having a transportation system, of having a healthcare system, an education system, of having a, a, a social service uh, network that will attract the youth from around the world. Forget just San Francisco. Um, to my earlier point about that, that international survey, uh, it was showing that Toronto is right there attracting youth. Um, but in order to attract youth, you do need the jobs. You need the businesses. You need them to, to see that potential as well. I believe in the last 10 years, that's happened. The commercial growth, of course, was not at the same extent of residential growth, but it was 10 times what it was in the 90s. 
That's what our growth has been commercial-wise in the city of Toronto for the last 10 years. It just went like that. And you can't just have, to your point, condos going up. You need jobs to come along with them. Well, that's really, I mean, the idea of who are you building the city for is fascinating, right? Because if the city is too expensive for people, if they can't get on the subway, if they're afraid to ride their bicycle because the bike lanes aren't maintained, et cetera, et cetera, people will choose to go somewhere else, right? So, right. so how do you, who has to take the lead? Like, who, who decides that that, that is a, a huge part of, of what we're doing? It's not building, you always say you're building the city for the next generation, but, but what is it that, that can be done to ensure that people feel that the investments are for them as well. If you dive into the details of the official plan that's going through now, including all of you know Jennifer Kiesmatt's transportation plan, it's got the bike lanes, it's got all of that there, and it is trying to build you know a live work city. Um, we have more towers going up in downtown Toronto, literally, than New York City for the last five years. It's been close, we're up and down, but we're we're virtually as high, if not higher, than New York City. And then the rest of the North American cities are way below. So, and, and as I said, the commercial growth has kept pace. The, the big challenge is making sure that, that that continues. But the infrastructure to have that mesh and all the pieces come together, yeah. quite frankly, the start is that vision of the official plan. I'm sure Paul will agree that you got to map it out first and ensure that council sees what's needed in order to attract, have that economic development piece as well. I haven't talked about that. I could talk on active for a long time and there's a GTA marketing agency coming now and that's gonna be huge for the whole greater Toronto area. But it's all those pieces and an official plan is what pulls all those pieces and that vision together uh, to make sure it happens. And then it's a matter of all the other pieces in terms of funding to make sure it happens. And but, if it doesn't. But, you're, but to your point, yes, City Hall has to embrace that has to make sure it is a key strategic action, which it is in black and white, but we have to deliver on it. A couple more, quickly. quickly. And Paul wants that. Oh yeah, Paul's got a question. He can't resist. <laughs> Okay, um, so having worked in Toronto Community Housing Corporation on the vulnerability question, uh, I was wondering, you, saw, you said that this has been a aligning of the stars for funding. Do you see this right now, the alignment of social service and human service delivery and options for consolidating provincial, federal, and municipal services? And do you think that now there's been any promising developments in that respect? Okay, good question, because I haven't talked enough about the coordination collaboration of social services. Um, for, for community housing, I've been focusing on the state of good repair and the mm -hmm. growth of the capital and the need that way for our growing population. But in delivery of services, you're right, I think, where you're headed. We need a, to do better in terms of coordination of our resources. That is happening. You don't see some of it yet. You've got ex-general manager of three rows in front of you that was doing a lot of great legwork to start that up at the provincial level and within even city coordination. If getting into governance, the TCHC, from my viewpoint, was too autonomous. And I, one of my pet peeves for the five years was to get them more engaged with the city and, and make sure we maximize the resources that we had in social housing and social services at the city and not having them duplicate some of those services and then they couldn't afford them so there was really nothing there. There was no social infrastructure. What is being mapped out now at the city right now under the leadership of Phil uh, was to pull together those pieces to make sure that we are now city service-wise working with TCHC and working with our provincial partners as well. I'll go a step further. That's kind of, I hope, the, the answer to what you were looking for. No? A anyway. Uh, I will say this. I, I often complain that as an ex-CFO, the funding had to be uploaded for social services for social housing, and it still has to. The one thing that that I believe has been a benefit. Other provinces, it's all funded by the provincial government and federal governments. 
and it's delivered for the most part by the province in other provinces. I think even though we went through pains here, everybody I believe agrees at the province and at the city that it should be delivered by the city. So we've kind of fallen into a mechanism where let's deliver the social services at the city level, coordinate it better to solve those problems for the vulnerable in Toronto community housing, but work in partnership with the province so that that happens. They can still guide by policy, they can guide by funding, uh, all of it. But the city is running. But the, the city is delivering, right. similar to what's happened with the other social services. Uh, and we can expand some of those roles. In fact, there, there are other discussions that are happening at the province that, that were where we can take on some service delivery as well. And anyway, that, I, I hope that answers your question. You wanted a question from Paul Bedford. I, I'm uh, fearing the question from Paul. All right, Bedford. it may be the last question because we're just about out of time, but there's gonna be a reception after so people can mob you, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I, I, there's so many questions uh, <laughs> lots of us could ask, but I, I'm going to come back to your sense of optimism, and we're a little over two years away from the next municipal election. And one of the hot topics is the ranked ballot debate. And we all know, I think, what council has already decided, uh, but I'd be really interested in your candid views uh, as to what you think will happen in the next year or so leading up to that election. Do you think the, the, the council may change their mind, reverse themselves. Uh, well, where do you see all that going? My guess, and right now, that, that's a topic that is so divisive um, that right now I, I would really be guessing, Paul, as to what would happen. I think their current position would stand. The one thing that people forget about, I'm sure you're aware of, though, is I, my guess will be that it won't be this election, it'll be the next one. Next one. Why? Because we don't even have the infrastructure election-wise to do it. Our system literally is so old that we were just about to upgrade it, and the big question is, can the clerk and, and, the, and, and the IT guys literally build something, because there's nothing out there, to our knowledge, that would meet our needs within that time frame. And as I was winding down, the answer I was hearing was, it, there's just not enough time. And Is it something you support? I, I do believe, yes, I, I do believe that the rank system uh, makes sense. What will it do for I the I think it's, it, think? it's also the details of, yeah. of, of exactly what the ranking is. People have talked about um, you know, voter engagement, voter turnout, uh, better representation, uh, higher slate of candidates, perhaps. What do you think? It, it would do? I would hope. My fear with ranked is that, that will that be the impetus to raise us from well, around 45 to 50 percent usually in, in a Toronto election, lower in other municipalities? Will that raise it from 50 to 90? I don't know. I think it'll raise it, but I think it, you know, even if it raised it to 60 or two-thirds of, of, of residents are voting, it'd be huge. Any, any mechanism to do that, um, to me, is, is worth the investment. And then there's the whole issue of, you know, principle of, of rank. I believe in prin principally that it makes sense, that, that because of our, 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 our system, um, with so many people running an award or as a mayor or whatever, um, that and, and I guess being more of an accountant, mathematician, and, and wanting to get it right, I think that rank ballots make sense for giving me as a resident voting more direction to, to democracy as to who I really support. People keep coming up to you before we started here and they say, you look so great. You look relaxed, <laughs> you look rested. Do you miss the job at all? You know, so many people said you're never going to relax. You're, you'll always be, you know, on edge. You'll be you know, following everything. Now I phoned Rob a, f a few times. I shouldn't have, but um, end of the day, Matt, I I knew the time was right. I knew that I was going to cut the cord, and uh, there's been more call, a few calls and transition coming the other way, um, and. I will always, of course, follow what's happening and pick up the phone periodically.
but uh, I have cut the cord and I'm happy I cut the cord. On the other hand, um, the key thing for me was some transition. I think I mentioned that I, I wanted to do a few days a week. And why did I come to U of T? Because that transition made it easy for me for a session like this to talk to ex-colleagues ex uh, and colleagues um, about issues that are just important to us and, and that we all have passion about. Um, both here, the Global City Summit, performance measurement we didn't even talk about. A key issue for me, I was involved with the Ontario, um, uh, uh, Ontario benchmarking initiative from the beginning, 15 years ago. Uh, I feel passionate that we learn from one another and I feel passionate that, that we're actually here leaders in many respects because of those type of initiatives. I've got, I've got an off your question, but <laughs> it's an example of why I want to stay in touch through the University of Toronto yeah. and the two institutes that I'm involved with. Um, I, I, I think I can add some value in research that's happening here, uh, but I also think that I can learn a lot too and I'll never um, you know, want to uh, not comment on cities. Uh, and if I can just summarize one other point that I, I forgot, um, and it may be kind of a wrap up for me at least, Matt. Um, 39 years, and my first 10 years in Edmonton, 19 years in 905 country, and almost 14 years city of Toronto. When I first started, we were always referred to as the third level of government and the province is referred to as a subnational government. And I would say as of 10 years ago, that stopped. And now we're constantly talking as partners. I would almost go as far as to say it's almost gone its head. Where is the growth in every country in the globe, in cities? We're now, I think, worldwide at 60% in urban centers. In Canada, it's closing on 80%. Cities are the future. And I, I often say to myself, I lucked out. I was actually going to get a bank job when I graduated. <laughs> but my future wife and I wanted to go out west, and it's a long story, but I got a gov government job at the city of Edmonton, which I just, after three, four years, I knew I wanted to stay in it. Uh, but I really think cities are the future. and anything I can still assist in, in terms of research or whatever, to give my thoughts as to how, at least within Toronto and, and Ontario and Canada, we can uh, grow with cities across the globe, I'm in heaven. So uh, I'm relaxing, but doing some work that is fun. I'll just say that's the way it is. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Joe Panachetti. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you, Joe and Matt, for that thoughtful and engaging discussion. You were speaking, obviously, to a very knowledgeable audience, so thank you for the great questions as well. Um, I'm, the, uh, I'm Linda White. I'm the Interim Director at the School of Public Policy and Governance, and I've been asked to say a few words to cap off this afternoon's fantastic conversation. And I promise I won't keep you too long from the reception waiting just outside, to which you're all invited. We are honored that Joe Penichetti accepted our invitation to become a senior fellow at the School of Public Policy and Governance and at IMFG earlier this year. And after today's conversation, I can, I'm sure you can see why. Uh, Joe's wealth of experience in public policy um, enhances the, the school's capacity to have thoughtful and intelligent discussions on issues related to municipal public policy and finance and enhances the university uh, as a whole. So um, we are thrilled that he has begun his next career with us at the university. So please join me in thanking him once again for sharing some of his insights and expertise with us.
in academia we say you can never retire. So <laughs> We are also so thrilled to have the privilege of having Matt Galloway moderate this conversation this afternoon. There is no greater voice on urban engagement than Metro Morning. Um, I imagine everyone in the room is, um, is a fan and so appreciative of the passion with which you cover urban affairs. So thank you for dedicating your afternoon to this event. We could not think of a better moderator for today's conversation. Thank you. And finally, I want to thank Enid Slack and the Institute of Municipal Finance and Governance for hosting this afternoon's event, and Selena Zhang and Caroline Cardipal and Matteo Piri for organizing it. I look forward to additional opportunities for partnerships between the school and the institute in the future. <laughs>